Hey everybody, what's up? Uh, I'm going to be talking about the Bianca Devins case today. I plan to do several more vlogs where I go into depth about particular issues that the case has uh, brought up, um, notably social media, the different roles that it's been playing since this case broke on Sunday and I would like to go uh, more into depth about uh, Bianca herself. Today I'm going to discuss uh, Brandon and uh, his father, whose name is Jason W. Clark. Uh, yesterday it came out that not only does Brandon's father have an extensive criminal history, uh, but he attempted to carry out a ver very similar uh, type of crime, was not as successful, thank God, as Brandon was, uh, but it's uh, pretty, pretty unbelievable. And I want to provide the details of that. I want to talk about trauma and the brain and what it does <clears throat> to those of us who have PTSD and the role that, uh, in my view, my educated opinion, um, that Brandon, by carrying out a crime similar to and worse than his dad's, uh, was the result of untreated trauma slash PTSD. And uh, then I want to actually show something pretty darn nuts. Pretty crazy. And then I want to show a couple of images of Bianca herself that I'm pretty sure you haven't seen. So um, first I'm going to show the uh, obit and it's from Legacy. And so Bianca is going to be, um, she's going to have her funeral this afternoon. I actually considered going up there, but from Philly, actually I was going to look and see how long. I was thinking it would probably take about five hours. It was just a, you know, it was just an idea. It wasn't, I, I knew that I, well, you know what? My car would never make it. <laughs> um... But uh, yeah, that's going to be taking place in about seven hours from now. It's nine in the morning uh, on the 18th. And um, I say some prayers for her and her family and her loved ones. Four hours, 32 minutes. I'm not bad. I've done a lot of my of driving in my day, especially long distance, so I'm not surprised. But that's actually not that bad a drive. It's not that bad. But I'm sure it's going to be mobbed. Probably going to be completely mobbed media. It's going to be a madhouse. So, um... So, I'm going to dis describe and discuss what happened with, um... Brandon's father, Jason... And then I'm going to play a very brief video that just details a little bit more of uh, Jason's history. Uh, but I want to spotlight the crime that Jason Clark committed. Um, the one that involves uh, Brandon's mother. So basically, I'm sure some of you, you know, have already familiar with it and have heard what happened. But in 2010, January 2010, January 4, um, Jason Clark held his wife at knife point and held her hostage uh, in their home in um, Fulton, New York, which is, uh, it is west of Utica. And 
It says police came to his home in the 500 block of Cayuga Street around midnight Monday morning for a report of a domestic dispute. Not long after the SWAT unit was on its way because they discovered that it was a standoff situation. Uh, and let me read you, I, I'd rather read it actually from Michelle's point of view. And this is uh, Brandon's mother. The father of Brandon, Andrew Clark, who allegedly slit the throat of social media star Bianca Devins and then posted photos of her dead body online, once threatened to kill the young man's mother in the exact same way as well as himself. So the suicide was also part of the plan with his dad. The Fulton man reportedly held his wife, Michelle Clark, hostage for 10 hours back in 2010 when Brandon was around 12 years old. Police said he kept authorities at bay by threatening to cut her throat. He wanted to make sure police knew he had the knife to my jugular, Michelle Clark told police. I thought he was going to kill me. Clark claimed he would also use the blade, described as a black-handled kitchen knife, to take his own life. It's unclear if Brandon was present during the incident, and I have something else about that that I want to actually address. Um... The, in the incident reportedly started over a dispute between Clark and Brandon's mother, which ended with Clark laying his hands on her. Michelle's mother, who lived with them at the time, called police, and they arrived on the scene to find Clark with a knife, claiming he was going to die tonight. Officers were eventually, around 10.30 in the morning the next that day, were eventually able to storm the house with tear gas cans, no less, and arrest clerk. Now it's funny because I'm reading this and I know I'm getting a little, it's a little hard for me to get going this morning verbally, but it's almost like, wait, who is this? Is this the crime that happened this week? Or is this a crime that happened in 2010? Which one is she talking about? Because it almost seems like the characters here are interchangeable. You have, you have Brandon and his father playing this one role, and then you have Bianca Devins and Michelle Clark, Brandon's mother, in this second role, and then you have the cops coming in, you have the knife, same prop, uh, you have this threat of suicide, it's just, to me, it is incredibly sad and it's incredibly tragic. You know why? Because it could have been prevented. I mean, with Brandon specifically. Now, this also makes me wonder, what is Jason's experience? What What is Jason's story, I mean? Like, what happened to him in order to precipitate that that kind of behavior. I can't help but believe, and I would bet money on it. I would bet, I would bet like 500 bucks on it. I could use the money that he endured abuse as well. And that there is a long history of abuse in this family. That was something that I pointed out when I did my lives. One in particular about Timothy Jones. Uh, there was a social, social worker who uh, was on the stand and gave a very impressive and incredibly thorough description and presented a discussion about how she had researched exhaustively uh, Jones's family history. And her point was that until somebody stops the abuse cycle in a family, it can it, it will continue and it goes 
like just like uh, just like addiction, you know, we at least now know a lot more about addiction and the and genes, and that uh, it runs in the family. Um, you can trace um, us alcoholics generations back, and abuse is the same exact thing um, because it's all mental illness. And I feel that we're Brandon. You know, I don't know what his mother's like. I don't know what kind of upbringing he had. Or, or I can, I know what kind of, that's obvious. Uh, not a healthy one, not a stable one. Um, what kind of relationship he had with his mom is what I'm saying. And I know he has stepbrothers and he's, I believe, a stepsister. So I believe there's another a step parent. Um, I don't know if he got any stability from his mom. Obviously, if his mother was, and this is not a judgment, this is just an observation. If his mother was married to a man like his dad, then his mom wasn't very stable herself. I hope that since she's been separated, I assume divorced, from um, Jason that um, she's been able to pursue and uh, have a, a much healthier and happier life. So, um, I do believe that this is what I think. I think, I think Brandon might have been there uh, during the standoff because I looked at, all right, I put it over here. I looked at Jason's criminal record. And again, you guys, if I'm still get, I'm kind of trying to get my feet right here, uh, it, sometimes it just takes me a little bit to get going verbally, and I'm sorry about that. Uh, I looked at his criminal record, have it right here, printed it out. And it says, I mean, he, oh my God, a lot of, a lot of stuff. What's wrong with this guy? Um, endangering the welfare of a child, two counts. Now, I don't know. Arrest. It, it might have been after. Because I don't want to, I'm not going to, I don't I want to just look. No, maybe not. Because here's the aggravated harassment. And this is all related to the case where he, um, that I'm, re I'm referring to here. I, th and my gut tells me, I, th I think, I think Brandon was there. Where else would he have been? He was uh, 12. And it was a... This is the other thing I think is interesting. That it was a... It was midnight. And it was a Monday. And um, when this happened... When, when, when Brandon... Uh, got into his uh, homicidal state. It was uh, Sunday. And I... You know, it was earlier in the morning, but it still stretched across the same kind of time period. It was around seven o'clock in the morning. So his father's um, hostage takeover at home in 2010 was also taking period time during that same period of time during in the morning. And that's, and it was the same side of the week. It was a Monday. And I mean, I, that, to me, is not a coincidence. Um, when there is trauma reenactment, uh, you know, the brain is, when the brain gets stuck in that place where it's kind of in, in traumatic memory, um, it gets stuck there and it, it, it aims to replicate 
the original or the original um, sorry the original trauma as exactly as possible. Um, so I'm I'm gonna just switch over and show you the video that I just mentioned, and uh, I will do that right now. Jason Clark has a history with the court system, and according to Oswego County court records, he was arrested four different times. In 1996, Clark was convicted of assault. In 1998, he was convicted of burglary. And in 2002, Clark was convicted of attempted criminal possession of a forged instrument. And most recently, in 2010, he was in a 10-hour standoff with Fulton police. Clark faced five charges for threatening to kill his wife at the time by holding a knife to her throat. Court records say Jason Clark threatened police with physical harm and threatened to harm the woman if police tried to step in. Utica police tell me they have no indication right now that his son, Brandon Clark, killed Bianca Devins because of what his father tried to do in 2010. Devin's friend, Tia Parker, says she holds Brandon Clark responsible and isn't making much of the apology Jason Clark gave to the Devin's family. I don't think there is any way to really excuse or, or apologize for something so horrible. No apology is going to make it any better. We, we just wish she was here. She was a beautiful person inside and out, a kind heart a friendly smile, very helpful, and she did make a positive impact in many people's lives. And Utica police also told me that while they aren't looking into mental illness for Brandon at the moment, the investigation is ongoing and they have a lot more digging to do as to what. Okay, that last bit, when I first heard that, that there's a question of mental illness, I want to jump off a building. Like, you can't be serious. And in my mind, that is exactly why this shit happens. A question of whether there's mental illness? Maybe that's why I can't talk today, because I just feel like I feel lately I've been dealing with a lot of denial around me to things that to me they're very difficult truths to look at but they're truths and like just my mom is kind of like that like oh kind of I'm being nice love my mom okay but my mom is one of the biggest even self-described um people with she says i always put my head in the sand i don't want to i don't want to look at the, the things that are really difficult to look at you know she, she is so in denial about like everything and growing up with her you know trying to get her to understand how much she was hurting me by her drinking and that my dad was hurting me particular with his drinking and her yelling and accusing me of things all the time it was like she never wanted to hear it and everything was always my fault uh, and when I encounter denial now you know it's like denial renders renders others voiceless and it's kind of like, no, I want to adhere to my reality. I don't want to hear what you have to say. And so, you know, I'm not surprised the media is doing that, of course, but it's just, it's very disturbing to me. And I think it um, prolifer pro proliferates ignorance. Um, oh, there could be a question. Oh, so he might not be mentally ill. You just described what his father did. What do you think? You know? So, 
Just wanted to say that. And then they're also they also said there is no. There, we don't really know if you know he did this because his, if his father did what he did nine years ago. It's like, what do you think? Does that really need to be in question? Like, not that he planned it. I don't believe he planned it, but um, I'm, I'll go into what I think happened. And I just want to say, you know, obviously I'm not a clinical professional, um, but I'm not a layman either when it comes to psychological issues and concepts. I've been in therapy for 30 years and huh, and um, I have learned a lot from a lot of like a plethora when I think about it of professionals of, from psychologists and psychiatrists and so social workers and I know quite a lot uh, I have I feel a very I've been told by them a very sophisticated understanding of myself um, of uh, psychology of how the brain works and why things happen like they do when it comes to traumatic experiences um, So, and I hope I kind of do this, um, I do this justice. I'm going to talk about that right now. I'm going to talk about uh, trauma. Actually, before I do that, I don't want you to have the smoke in your face. Before I do that, uh, I am going to show just a couple pictures um, of that his dad's uh, crime. Well, first, here's, um, here is Jason Clark's mugshot. I believe that was from uh, the 2010 event. And then this was a photo outside. It looks like it ha that was the other thing I thought was really interesting is that it happened during a snowstorm blizzard it looks like January 2010 I'm trying to remember if I remember oh yeah I think I January 2010 I have to think about what what I was doing back in January 2010 Let's see if I can remember on the East Coast how many uh, what kind of snowstorms went if there was one right after New Year's interesting and then this was another photo. I do not believe that's the house. I, I believe the house is the one, not the, it's not the yellow one, but it's the one, and I'll show you why. I believe the house, um, it's 512 Cayuga. I believe that's the one on the left, the bluish one. And um, I will show you why. I did do a Google Earth image, here it is. So that's where it led me to this. So you see, there's the yellow house. It looks like, yep, the yellowish brown house on the left. And there you have the blue one, I believe, is, is the right one. Regardless, it's either the yellow house or the blue house, but the blue house is the one that uh, Google Earth brought me to. All right, so now I'm going to talk about trauma. I'm going to try. So I was looking up, you know, I was thinking about Brandon and that he had basically reenacted his father's crime, almost down to the letter. You know, um, used the same storyline. It was almost like he was acting in a play. And it was, in a way, as if he was just going through the motions. Like, he knew the story by heart. And 
something in him took over and for some reason and explain what the reason is what I think it is something took over and needed to replay it and if any of you have ever been through trauma or even let's just say at the most basic level a really disturbing conversation you had with someone or or an argument you had with your spouse or your child um something just displeasant and it's something that it's almost like when you eat something bad <laughs> it repeats on you and and you you get indigestion from it um so when you have that negative memory it's always stored in your brain and be and, and for whatever reason if you keep returning to it there is a specific reason why and most likely it has something to do with feeling some sort of fear some sort of um anxiety um some sort of emotional a lack of emotional safety maybe feeling exposed uh, maybe feeling uh, like there was a toxic element in the relationship that you needed to keep yourself from so the brain when things like that happen the brain is always going to try and keep figuring out it, it trying to figure it out if there is something to be reckoned with and trauma is kind of like that but on a grander scale because trauma particularly when it happens on a it, during childhood during infancy when the brain is still developing and it's still forming so it isn't you know it's trying to it's trying to develop and, and develop healthily when a traumatic event invades upon that development it reorders and re systemizes the natural order of things and it destabilizes the brain because it's a neurological response to feeling threatened and particularly when children are in dysfunctional unstable homes where there's a lot of arguing or there is abuse or there is uh, substance abuse uh, or even sometimes poverty uh, and neglect the child when that when that kind of experience repeats over and over and over and over the brain is really effed because the the child can't doesn't feel a sense of self-preservation the child is constantly having to deal with an overflow of uh stress an overflow of um neurons firing and uh particular brain chemicals like a surplus of them in the brain um because they're always in this fight or flight situation and so the brain the brain chemistry gets completely messed up and um the child is constantly preoccupied with survival instead of just existing and when that happens for a long period of time when the child grows up and becomes an adult that brain is still organized in that child state it still thinks that um it's still wired for the child in survival mode and it is ill-equipped to to um the person is ill-equipped to really deal with the world 
on an adult level, on a um, emotionally um, mature level. Sometimes there's very poor impulse control as a result of the, the anxiety and the rage and the, uh, the uh, overflow of, of negative affect during this type of childhood. Um, that child who grows up often will choose friends and eventually mates who uh, replicate the same set of circumstances that he or she grew up in. Why? Because the brain has not yet figured out that it's in a different time and place. It's still wired for what happened before because the trauma has not been dealt with and has not been resolved. So I'm just going to read something um, from, um, I believe this is from, so this is a special academy version of an article originally published in the Journal of the California Alliance for the Mentally Ill. Uh, it's just one little paragraph. It's uh, under the heading, Implications of Trauma-Related Alterations in Brain Development. And that's what I was just trying to describe, but this will do a better job. And this is um, focusing on child trauma specifically. All experiences change the brain, yet not all experiences have equal impact on the brain. Because the brain is organizing at such an explosive rate, in the first years of life, experiences during this period have more potential to influence the brain in positive and negative ways. Traumatic experiences and therapeutic experiences impact the same brain parts and are limited by the same principles of neurophysiology. Traumatic events impact the multiple areas of the brain that respond to the threat. Use-dependent changes in these areas create altered, is what I was talking about, altered neural systems that influence future, future functioning. That's what I was just saying, that the system gets altered in childhood during the trauma and then future functioning becomes impaired. In order to heal, i.e. alter or modify trauma, therapeutic interventions must activate those portions of the brain that have been altered by the trauma. So, as I said, there has to be some sort of intervention later on in order for that brain to know how to re, re scramble itself back to normal. Understanding the persistence of fear related emotional, behavioral, cognitive, and physiological patterns can lead to focused therapeutic experiences that modify those parts of the brain impacted by the trauma. Our evolving understanding of neurodevelopment suggests directions for assessment, intervention, and policy. Primary among these is a clear rationale for early identification and aggressive, proactive interventions that will improve our ability to help traumatized and neglected children. The earlier we intervene, the more likely we will be to preserve and express a child's potential. And I would also say the earlier that is intervened upon, the less likely it is for the child to grow up into an adult who will either be self-harmful, self-destructive, harmful to others, and or both. And I think that that, to me, that is exactly what happened to Brandon Clark. I also want to say that it is known, and because I've uh, read, and I will be going through these um, in a, another vlog, that uh, Bianca herself um, she said that she was in the system. She was in the, I believe, in the foster system. Uh, I think she was taken from her parents. Um, and there hasn't been, obviously, I think that the, the, the victim's family is being protected right now. Um, yet, at the same time, I mean, I look at Brandon as a, as a victim, too. And I am going to say this, I say this ad nauseum, on my channel. I do not condone criminal behavior. That is not what I'm doing. I know it may sound like that at times to some of you, but that is not what I'm doing. What I want is is for there to be healing and I want there to be awareness of why these things are happening, why they've been happening, why 
so that because I believe that these events are preventable. And I'm going to read something else. Um, but I, before I do that, I just also want to say that I feel that trauma is not dealt with properly or in, in the, that there aren't enough, like there are trauma therapists. They'd say they're trauma therapists, trauma experts, and they're not. In order to have a really comprehensive understanding of trauma, particularly childhood trauma. One has to be very, I think, very progressive in his or her thinking as a professional. There are a lot of therapists, for example, that still believe in false memory syndrome. That there are women who are um, falsely reporting uh, having been sexually abused. The reason for that whole movement involves that we live in a society and have for centuries that is uh, patriarchal. And women's experiences have been and are still marginalized. And it is usually men who abuse women, girls. Let me say this now, because I know I can hear the yelling. I can hear it. You're saying all men are abusers. You're saying all men are this. No, no, I'm not. It's just statistically proven fact. I mean, we, that's, this, that's the kind of society we have lived in. It's historical fact, and it is historical, it is, <laughs> It is present day contemporary fact that is the still the society that we live in. Men still have the most power. Um, white men are at the top of the food chain. <clears throat> you can argue with me. You can say I'm wrong, but show me proof. <laughs> um, I'm not trying to be argumentative and I'm not trying to be uh, flip. I'm not trying to be um, I'm not a man hater, okay? Uh, you know, please, do, you know, that's not where I'm coming from. I'm trying, there are many, there are many things that are very difficult to look at in our society, and I feel that abuse is one of them. Abuse gets minimized, it gets shoved under the rug. I have to tell you how many meetings that I've been to um, of, of addicts where I hear people saying, you know, I had a great family. I had such a great upbringing. My parents were awesome. They did everything for me. Oh my God. Uh, my dad and I are still so close. And then in the next breath they go, yeah, so my dad was an alcoholic and, um, he beat my mom and, um, and I'm like, whoa, wait a second. What? <laughs> That's denial right there. And I hear it all the time. And it's because, again, the brain, it, it, it's like when people go through that kind of shit, they still, there's a part of them that cannot, because when the person was vulnerable and, and depended upon their parents to take care of them and, and, and nurture them and nourish them, they were being hurtful and violent. And some, t I, I, the brain, as I said, changes. It, it's like, it's like clay, um, because the brain is all about protecting it, the organism that it is in. And if the organism is in any kind of physical danger, the brain will adjust. You know, like some people who say, I've heard stories about like, you know, someone who was going to almost was in a car accident, but they did, they didn't even think, but all of a sudden at the last second they did the absolute right thing that they needed to do but it was it had no thought involved and it saved them and that is the brain working in survival mode 
So let me just read this one other thing about PTSD. This is from Psychology Today. Um, it's from an article called How PTSD and Trauma Affect, Affect Your Brain Functioning. Uh, consequences of brain dysfunctions and PTSD. Hyperarousal. Because the amygdala is overactive, and let me actually bring up my image of, um, I have a brain, brain image here. Hold on one sec. Where's my brain? Where's my brain? Oh, maybe I didn't bring it up. All right, I'll get it now. I thought I did. Oh, maybe not. No, I decided I wasn't almost going to use it, so. All right, so where's my brain? There it is. So this is an example of what's happening in the brain when there are numerous and numerous stressors. Look at all that craziness going on. Um, it, all the, the arrows are showing um, where the different t types of neurotransmitters are going. You know, this, this is not, and this is a, um, this came from a, a medical journal. Um, you don't need to understand what all the different um, symbols are and where the arrows are going. Uh, what's important to, to remember is, or to, to observe from this diagram, is that when you are under severe stress, all this is going on, all these neurotransmitters and all this, this information, in order for the organism to, to, to preserve itself, this is all happening. Now imagine if this was a child's brain and this was happening all the time. Just think about that for a second. I mean, in a way, that that's exactly what my childhood was that diagram right there. And that's why that's why I'm still a mess. I mean, I've been trying to f get my SHIT together for a long time. And I have to say that part of the reason that I haven't is because a lot of the therapy that I got was not adequate. It's not because I'm unfixable, although, you know, I actually also think that way, but I, I, I know that's not true, that the brain can rewire itself. But I felt that way for a very long time, and it's very depressing to feel that way about yourself. But, I mean, I have worked so hard, and I have been going to therapy and spending money in an effort to, to get better and to be more of the person I was meant to be without all this insanity going on in my head that you see up here. So let me just continue reading this and with the diagram up there. Okay, so, it, so effects of excess norepinephrine, which is a neurotransmitter, include hyperarousal, hypervigilance, increased wakefulness, and sleep disruption. As a result of hyperarousal, people with PTSD can get emotionally triggered by anything that resembles the original trauma. Highlight there. For example, a sexual assault survivor telling her story on TV, meaning if you're a sexual assault survivor yourself and you observe it, um, if you, you observe or hear, hear a loud noise, or you pass somebody on the street who looks like your assailant. That's an ex those are examples. Symptoms of hypervigilance means uh, you are frequently keyed up and on edge, while increased wakefulness means you may have difficulty sweep, sleeping or wake up often in the middle of the night. Reactive anger and impulsivity. A reactive amygdala, now the amygdala is the part of the brain that is stimulated. Um, it's right, it's, it's in the middle of the temporal lobe. Um, it's right in the middle there, uh, at the top right in the center. Um, it's a very small part of the brain and um, it, is it is designed here it's saying uh, to detect threats in the environment and activate your flight or flight flight or flight response to activate the sympathetic nervous system to help you deal with the threat just like I said um, the car the, um, the car accident example. Um, so those are those are its two 
functions. Now, so an overact, overreactive amygdala what is what you deal with when you, when you have PTSD. It means you're, you're constantly on the alert and ready for quick action when you perceive anything that seems like a threat, even though it may not be. Um, and what, that leads you to be more impulsive. Um, it can also inhibit motor behavior, physical action, when it is not appropriate or necessary. In people with PTSD, um, uh, you may have less control over reactive anger and impulse behaviors when you are emotionally triggered. Reactive anger can cause damage to uh, career success and um, to interfere with relationship functioning. Now, the reason uh, that I'm bringing this up in regards to this this case is because I think that that's exactly what happened to Brendan. I think that this is going on in his brain. This has been going on in his brain for a long time. And it hasn't been properly dealt with or healed. Uh, I do not know if he's ever been to therapy. He's only 21 and I started going when I was 19. And by age 21, I'd only had two years at that point. And I was only really just learning uh, about what was happening to me, what had happened to me, and how to work on it and work through it to the other side, which I'm still waiting for. But, <laughs> but so I wanted to show that image. I'm going to take that down now. Um, I hope that's the, I hope that this is helpful. I have no damned idea if it is. Uh, as I said, you know, I'm not a freaking professional. And in a lot of ways, when I talk about this stuff, I, I feel like I sound like a, a dumbass because I don't... It, it's hard to, for anybody to, to, to explain all of this. It's very, very complicated stuff. It's, it's the, it, there's so much going on in the brain. But I think, I'm hoping that I basically tackled it, and I hope also that showing the brain diagram helped a little bit. Uh, I know that often when, when there's a visual, it's a lot easier to, um, to understand or put two and two together to figure things out. That was my light. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Are you going to stay? I have a crazy cacophony of lights here, and they're all art lights, they are not professional, like, lights for lighting people, and they're just, they're broken, and I have to hang them up places, and put tape on them to make them stand up, and all that stuff, so that's why that happened. Okay, so, okay. I'm going to show um, a couple of images that I thought might be interesting uh, in regard to this case. Um, there are a couple text messages um, from that evening and morning uh, when Bianca was killed. Uh, there is There are some images of Brandon and his uh, brothers. Um, there's some images of Bianca. Uh, and there are also some, uh, actually those aren't, I just thought of something I'm going to save. Um, but there's also something that I discovered right before I was going to come on here that I gave me the absolute chills and I cannot wait to show it. Cannot wait to share it. Uh, okay. So let me show you these images. So this is Bianca's last series of texts. She was known, I think, by most of her friends as Bia, which I think is a really cute nickname. And I found this, I believe this was Discord. And that was the night of um, the concert. Uh, Yesterday at 7.31 p.m., finding parking when she was with Brandon and uh, definitely, I think, another friend. Yesterday at, uh, oh, wait a second, not that one. Oh, 
Okay, wait. So this, I'm sorry. My bad. It wasn't the concert, but it looks like... <laughs> it looked like... Oh, no, it is. All right. I think so. Because, I mean, it was her last word. So it was... I think this was that Saturday. Yeah. Okay, so you know what I did? I read the text backwards. So the last text, I think, here was finding parking. Because the concert was at 8.30. And I think they're talking... She might be talking about the guitarist in the band earlier. So I was right. I just read it backwards. Jesus. Um, so that was pretty crazy to see that. And this was on Discord. Um, I believe that was Sunday afternoon. Someone is asking what concert. So that's like they kind of just came into the conversation. Uh, what concert are you talking about that she went to? And there's that same person, Lex B2, God, I'm sad. And um, June saying, this doesn't feel real at all. And Lex says, it doesn't, WTF. And it's pretty intense to see that uh, exchange between her friends. Um, this is a statement about, uh, what happened on the 14th. And just kind of gives a uh, rundown about the, uh, events. You know, they were talking about, um, on the news today about the, the body cam footage. I cannot imagine what that must look like and i wonder at some point if that's ever going to emerge obviously not until after the trial but you know you know watts style i wonder if that stuff will ever emerge it's pretty crazy to think about but i want you just uh, to look at really quick to look at where it says um the calls were originating on post street in the city of utica Officers were dispatched at that location. Post Street is a dead-end street which runs east to west from Culver Avenue. The street terminates into a wooded area where the first arriving officer located a black SUV with a male lying on the ground beside it. And just keep that image in your head for a second. I'll, I'll do this now. So... I wanted to look at Post Street a little bit closer. And I wanted to see, well, you know, so I went on to Google Earth and I wanted to see if I could maybe get some kind of idea of exactly where this happened. And boy, did I. So this is Post Street. I don't know how many feet from the dead end, but that is toward the end of it. And that's basically where you, in those clips, the news clips, you see the, um, you know, all the uh, uh, trucks of uh, law enforcement fire, and they're all kind of about at this point. Now, this is the next shot closer in toward the dead end. Now, if you can, if you look, if you squint, that yellow line is, I believe, a, it's, it's Google line. It's not the, an actual line drawn in the middle of the street. If you look, so if you look at the end of that yellow line, and then you look up like about an in, half an inch, you can see the red stop sign at the end. Okay? I, I mean, I'm just telling you, when I saw this, I had chills. This is the next... The next shot closest in. And you see the stop sign there, right? Um, almost like dot. It's like a dot to the eye of that yellow line. Okay, now this next one, I'm telling you, this is the creepiest thing I've seen in a really long time. This is where they were. This is where he took her. In here. 
That's as close as I could get. But that is a secluded area. Now, I don't know why that stop sign is there, unless there was a road at some point. Why would that stop sign be there? I mean, that's almost like, again, like, again, a set stage. You know, here's the end of your life. Here's the end of both of their lives, technically speaking. And this, it looks like a grave with a headstone, now that I think about it. And it's shrouded and, and dark and, and forgotten. And I just thought this was the darkest, creepiest thing that I'd seen in a really long time. And to think that that's where it all happened. Oh my God, I mean, I'm getting the chills just looking at it. Now I want to go there. I want to see it. But I couldn't I couldn't believe that. I I did not expect to find that. But that is a very you know, it's not just the visual, it's it's that it looks like a grave and it's the end of the road and it's a stop. I mean, I assume that's probably a makeout place and I don't know why they if that's, you know, I'd like to love to know what they were talking about in the car before they pulled up there. That blew me away. Oh my god. Um, you know, I actually almost, I think I'm going to stop there. I'm going to stop there. Um, because I think it's a good place to stop for now. Uh, just hold on one second. Coming back. Uh, Yeah, I knew this was going to be, for me, kind of a shortish one. Um, I just, there's so much that I want to share, and I will share um, next time. I think I'm going to probably do, uh, I'll either focus on Bianca herself, or I will, um, I will focus on the social media aspect of things, because I know that's been a really big uh, topic uh, in the news and how Instagram's been dealing with uh, the photos and um, what's been happening with that and the movement of the pink clouds, which I think is very interesting. So I hope you guys, uh, I hope you dug this video. I hope I did an okay job describing brain trauma, all that stuff. It's, it's a very, very complicated topic. And it's, um, uh, I, I really appreciate if you've actually listened to this video. Awesome. Um, please subscribe if you haven't. Uh, I will be posting uh, more uh, as uh, the days go on, and I'm always looking to check up on, I'm regularly checking to see if there's more news. And uh, also, um, if you do subscribe, hit the, the bell so you know when I'm going to upload. And then also um, hit the thumbs up if you thought this video did an okay job in its, uh, its goals. It's, it's aspirations. Okay, guys, have a good rest of your day, and uh, I will talk to you soon.